of uh, Leviticus, a, a little bit like that. I, I know it's good for me, but I don't have a taste for it. So something like that. Other people look at Leviticus like camping. They go to camping. We are going to experience going camping. But maybe some of us don't like go to go camping. So you packed away, you leave the place, and you will not do it again. Like you've tried to read Leviticus, but that was not really what you were looking for. And I think the, one of the reasons why it's like that is that we live in a, in a culture that we have to be entertained. It has to uh, have some actions and some excitement. And, and what we read, we, we are trained with the media. We grew up with the TV. And, and now we have all of these wonderful little things here. And it needs to be entertaining. If it's not entertaining, then it's boring. If it's boring, then I don't want it. I, I don't need it. I'm not interested in that. And you know, many of the things that we are entertained with and that we are watching, if you think about it, they are very irrelevant. You know, you can watch the, the World Cup in soccer or football. Wow! Goal! That is so exciting! But is it really relevant to your life? Is that changing you? Is that helping you, equipping you for your life? Is that doing something for your life? No, it's not. Because actually, in fact, the, the things that will impact your life the most or have changed the world are not really the most entertaining things. If you want to pass your driver's license, you have to read, the. let's say in Hong Kong, uh, you have to read the code, the book. This is not interesting. This is not in, uh, entertaining. But if you want to pass the exam, you will need to learn the code of all of that. If you are a, a, a homeowners in many of the cities and you want to, let's say, build a shed or do some renovation on your home, you will learn that there is a city code that will uh, t tell you if you are allowed to do this kind of uh, improvement or if you are not allowed. There's a city code. This is not entertaining to read these things, but it is necessary if you want to do certain things. So the, the book of Leviticus is, uh, is like that. Don't go to it because you just finished Genesis and Exodus, and these are really, really uh, extraordinary stories. The, the Red Sea, the ten plagues, you know, all of the things, the flood. It's really entertaining. And then you come to Leviticus, and it's not going to be entertaining. Leviticus is not a book to be feared. It's it's not a book to be avoided, but it's a book to be studied and understood and treasured, as you can see. There's a psalm, actually, that I, I was reading, uh, Psalm 119, verse 18, that says, and that I, I pray that it would be our prayer this morning, open my eyes that I may see wonderful things in your law. Can you say that with me this morning? Open my eyes that I may see wonderful things in your law. Because we assume many times that we are confused about the law, the New Testament. And the message is the same as I have been repeating throughout this, uh, this series so many, many times. And it's wonderful. So we need to open our eyes. There's a lot of good things in this, in this book. Let me ask you a question. Can you find love in the book of Leviticus? among all these bloody rituals and sacrifices. Can you find love in a book like this? The answer is yes. Look at God's intention. Let's look at the slide number two. Uh, if you follow my decrees and are careful to be my command. It starts like that. If you do that, what is God going to tell us that will take place? He's telling us his intention. Okay, there's a lot of rules. How many children love the parents' rules when they are small? Don't go there. Don't touch this. Uh, you know, go to bed now. Stop playing. You know, something. You, they, 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 no children love the rule of their parents. But parents have lived longer, they have more experience, they have more information uh, because they, they, they were there. So they set rules and boundaries in order to keep them healthy, to keep them safe. That's the same thing with God. Our Heavenly Father establishes rules and boundaries for us because He is a good Father. So He says, if you follow my instructions, if you keep, if you abide by my commands, this, this is, I'm, I'm your father, I'm your God, I'm, I'm holy, I want you to be like me. He is a good father and he loves me and he loves you. 
you might not understand his purpose. You might not agree with some of his laws. But we know that God is love. We know that God is good. We know that God is sovereign. And God wants us to live in a manner that at the end, it will bring blessing to us. That, that's the point. If we live according to his instructions, it will bring a dividend of blessings of his favor. Because in the book of Leviticus, we have seen this is about approaching him. This is about having access to his holiness. Because we are sinners, we cannot go there. But he's, he's, he's helping us. He wants us with him. So he's given us all of, these, all of these rules. You know, sometimes to appreciate something, you need to be deprived of it. Okay, wake up in the morning, go to the toilet, there's no running water. Wow, so now you know that water is so precious. Then you get into the kitchen, you switch the light on, you want to do coffee or tea, there's no electricity. It's so precious because you are deprived of it. You, know, you realize the, the utilities of it. So the book of Leviticus and all the rules and the regulation of God is like that. Imagine before this take place. Imagine before the moral codes of God were introduced into this world. Imagine the society of that time, killing each other. Just look at the time of Noah. Why did the flood come? What kind of society were there? Violent, cruel, only thinking about sin and abusing each other and violence and killing. This is a world without God. And because there is sin in this world, you see it all over the news. You see it all, all around. This morning, we received uh, a, a, a very sad text of uh, our sister Maui because of her friend in the U.S. The, the, the grandma is driving the car with the babies in the car, and a, a, a drunken man just killed the baby and the, the grandmother, you know, this morning. So the, why, why these things happen? Sin is in this world. Sin is destroying. Satan is leading people to away from God to not to live according to the rules of God and, and this. So God brought them to Sinai to instruct his people. And that through, through that, he instruct, instruct, instructing us how we are to live under God's kingdom, under his rule, so that we will experience joy, we will experience our money, and we will experience God's presence and the, the favor of the Lord. When you read Leviticus, when I read Leviticus, I see a God so loving that he is doing everything so that you and I will be taken care of our sin, we will be allowed to approach him, and God's presence will be with us. Look at the, the next part. Click this one. Yes. I will send you the seasonal rains. The land will yield its crops. You will eat your fill and live securely. I will give you peace. You will be able to sleep with no cause for fear. And if people who are stressed, they cannot sleep at night, God wants you to sleep. I will look favorably upon you, making you fertile and multiplying your people. I will fulfill my covenant with you. And the list continues. It's not a complete list, but just to, to highlight some of the things. It's very positive. So you see, oh, God's command, man. No, this is too strict. Oh, God's instruction. No, this is too much. But look at what he, his, his intention is. The, he wants his rules for you so that you will experience his blessing into your life. But the ultimate goal of God is even better than that. And the next verse, verse 11, you will see the next slide. I will live among you. I will not despise you. I will walk among you. I will be your God and you will be my people. This is the goal of Leviticus. This is the goal of the rules, the regulation, the sacrifice, the priesthood and all of this that finds its fulfillment in the Lord Jesus Christ in the New Testament. This is the goal of the Lord. Leviticus points to the heart of the Father that longs to dwell among his people. That is why you have the wonderful picture, the symbol of the presence of God among his people through the tabernacle in the Old Testament. This is a wonderful, uh, the greatest uh, picture that you can have of salvation, of God's intention. God wants 
to dwell among his people but you can see that there is still here a, a wall of separation because sin cannot reach to the glory of the Lord but God made a way God made the sacrifices, the priesthood, the sanctification so that we can approach and God can bless His people to all the blessings that we have read uh, previously. God is good. God has good intention. God is, so the, these, these rules and these regulations are for God. They are the foundation of our faith. They are the foundation of our society of order, of peace, of love in our, in our society. This is why we, we need that. The sacrifice point to the mercy of God. It provides for sin. It makes a way to approach God. The laws of Leviticus point to our protection. They protect us. We have seen it in previous studies about the cleanliness, the bodily uh, uh, things, and then all of these rules. They, they protect us from disease, from contaminations, from plagues, and all of this. It is for our blessing, for our prosperity, and our welfare. The tabernacle points to, to first of all his presence among us right now but it also as you read the book of uh, uh, Hebrews especially the tabernacle points to heaven to the true tabernacle in heaven so it's a picture that shows us the heavenly this is only uh, earthly this is this is a shadow of the one Jesus Christ returned to the right hand of the father he is reigning in the heavenly uh, temple and there you find that in uh, the book of Hebrews the priest points to Christ who stands at the right hand of the Father, who is pleading and interceding with us. The priests were supposed to help people to connect with God. Christ is doing it right now for you and for me. So we have seen that quite in details in the past. And then the, the, the book of Leviticus and the latest uh, chapter points to the feast. Seven feasts that God wants the, the his people to, to celebrate or to have some sorts of commemoration, some memories. And the feast uh, points to the joy of com coming near to God. The joy of coming in celebration together as God's people and to the presence of the Lord. To, have a, to be this unique, distinct set apart, accepted by God people. This is, this is great. We find all of that in the book of uh, Leviticus, and this is, this is so wonderful. And, uh, and this message that the tabernacle points to, to Christ, and that God's intention already, you find it in the Old Testament, God declares His intentions, I want to walk among you. I want to be your God and I want you to be. He wants to establish His presence. The last book of the Bible, click this slide, Revelation 21.3. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, See, the tent of God is among humans. He will make his home with them. They will be his people. God himself will be with them and he will be their God. That's where we're going. Leviticus is the foundation. It lays the foundation for all of this through a bunch of symbolism that is all fulfilled in Christ Jesus so that this is what lays ahead. This is where you are going, amen? This is what, what the, the book of Leviticus is giving us. So this morning I want also to talk about the practical side of holiness. Let's go to the next, the next slide. Leviticus 19.2 Give the following instructions to the entire community of Israel. You must be, okay, you, who is you? You, okay, this, the people of Israel first, you must be holy, but we, I, I, you, me, must be holy. Is that an option? It's a commandment, but it's also a promise. You will be holy, you must be holy, because I, the Lord your God, am holy. So l l chapter 19 is very interesting because it's, it's a call to you. Hello, are you there? Yes. This is very important. We're getting to the important part of the message. This is a call to you to be holy. It's not an option. You will be holy. You must be holy. If you want God, you will be holy. For I, the Lord, am holy. Okay, so now if holiness is God's nature and you and I, we are to be like Him, we better understand His nature. 
Is that right? Does that make sense? It's logic, isn't it? It is. So the, the chapter also concludes with, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of, of Egypt. And right after that, there's, we are going to look at a list of rules that stress that God's people should, uh, how they should live to be, to be holy. Okay, let's look at this, at this first list, okay? Because you are to mirror, li listen before we read. Just the, don't read, don't read. <laughs> okay, before you read that, okay. <laughs> Crazy pastor, okay. <laughs> you and I must be holy. So you must mirror, reflect this holiness. Is that right? We agree on that? Okay, so now we can read. This is, this is by doing this, that we are going to. This is how God introduced it to us. Because of His holiness in us, we should reserve food for the poor and the foreigners in agricultural. We should not steal, deceive, or cheat our neighbor. We should not oppress, defraud, or rob him. We should not insult, make fun, or curse the deaf or cause the blind to stumble. We should not show partiality in legal matters, favor the poor or favor the rich, or receive bribes or something like that. We should not spread slanderous gossip among your people, among their people. We should not nurse hatred in our heart and your heart for your brother. We should not seek revenge or bear grub. It's just like that. Stop there. This is really practical, isn't it? There's nothing like, ooh, you know, because when you say holy, you, you, you think like you must like, you cannot walk on the ground. You must walk higher. You must be like, ooh, so, so, so separated, so, 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 so churchy, you know, so worshipful, praying all the time, like, oh, hallelujah, hallelujah, you know, like something like some sorts of crazy sort of uh, personality, because this is so misunderstood. But God is saying, listen, I want you to be holy, and this is how I want you to express my character. Because when God concludes this chapter, he says, because I am the Lord that sets you free from Egypt. I have redeemed you. So God is a deliverer. God is a savior. God brings freedom. And God brings love. And he wants us to be with him. So God, this is his character. So God says, I want you now to reflect my character. How many of you this morning, you say, I love God. Yeah, you should not hesitate about that. Okay. So, I love God. So, God says, okay, you love me. This is how you are to live. So that this, this feeling, this passion, what's inside of your heart for me, is going to be made visible. It's going to be expressed in, in, in this way. Let's look at a few of them, because we are a church here, family. Let's look at a few of them. Verse 16. Do not spread slanderous gossip among your people. Do not stand, it's not there, but I'm, I'm reading a bit more of the verse. Do not stand idly when your neighbor's life is threatened. I am the Lord. Okay, here's something. Do not slander, bring gossip. And do not stand idly when your neighbor's life is threatened. Here there's a connection between slandering your neighbor. And because of your slander, his life gets to be in danger. You have damaged the life of that person, whether it is a, a, a family member, extended family, a jealousy about properties, whether it is a church member in, in the church, whether it is your husband or wife or whatever it is. You bring slander to someone, you gossip, Obviously, it's going to affect the reputation of that person, isn't it? And at some point, the life of that person will be in danger. And it could be like a court case. It could be very serious. You could be a false witness. Because slandering is already being a false witness, isn't it? So you are damaging the life, the reputation of someone, so that the life will be disturbed of that person. So God says, no, 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 no. I am the Lord. You are going to imitate me. You love me, you belong to me, 
You wholly like me? No, you cannot do that because me, I'm the, the, my personality is to deliver. My personality is to set free. My personality is to bless. My personality is to do you good. I'm not doing that. So if you are holy, you cannot do this. You understand? This is very practical. This is very basic. This is the most basic things. So, when you, you should turn against, you know, what you have done, humiliate yourself, and go to fix that. You should not stand idly. If you see that your slander has made that person getting in trouble with other people, losing their reputation or their money or court case, and you know that, you cannot do not stand idly. You cannot just ignore it and let it go and let the person die or let the person you know, go, go down and lose its reputation forever because of your word. You need to step out. You need to go and fix that. Who said that? Whose commandment is that? Is that the pastor or the church? No, it's God's. So if you want to be holy, you need to practice that. That's very serious. This is a very practical way. You see in this, in this list here, you will see that there is nothing very highly spiritual like we attend. Do not nurse hatred in your heart for any of your relatives. Confront people directly so you will not be held guilty for their sin. Okay, wow, this is so wonderful. Did you know it was in the Bible? You didn't know it was in the Bible. It's in the book of Leviticus. You have to dig to find that. That's what I'm saying. In this book, there are gems. If you dig, you will find them. If you don't, me, when, when, when I was preparing this message, I'm touched. I'm really, really touched. I have learned life-changing principle. I'm not making joke about that. I am really deeply touched because, wow, wow. Do not nurse hatred in your heart. This is, this is serious for any of your relatives. How do you nurse hatred in your heart? How does that happen? Something bad against you, words, injustice, unfair, or sinfulness in the family. You are witnessing something, or the person is doing something, is your friend. Oh, this is so dangerous for a Christian. Especially, I think, in the, in the Philippines. Because friends is very special in the Philippines. The social harmony of the family, extended family, is very important to keep peace, isn't it? So it's, it's a cultural point. So when you bring it into the church, what happens is that you are loyal to your friends more than to God. Unfortunately, that's how it happens. In, in many cultures, loyalty goes to our culture more than to God because this is how we've been uh, growing. Do not nurse hatred in your heart for any of your relatives. Confront, the, the, the remedy for that is confront people directly so you will not be held guilty for their sin. One of your friends is going the wrong way. It's going to hurt other people. It's not walking in the ways of the Lord. What are you going to do? You have to confront. And this is something that is very not practiced in the Christian communities around the world. Because it's very hard to balance it and to know how, when, is it worth it? It's, it's, it's very hard. Because many times Christian, we, we, we receive, let's say, a hurt. Or, or I'm frustrated about something that you have done or said or whatever it is. And it's affecting me. And it's unfair. But it's too hard for me to go and confront you. So I keep it in my heart. But when I see you tomorrow, you are upsetting me. Just to see you. You without even speaking a word. You, I've already started something in my heart. I don't like you. I like you less today than yesterday. It's, it's getting a bit worse. I'm, I need to talk to you, but I cannot talk to you. So tomorrow, you're coming again. And then when you walk here, I walk there. <laughs> you understand what I'm saying? Yes. It, it seems funny, but it's, it's very realistic. Because Christian, we don't know how to confront. We don't know how to rebuke. We don't know when, how, and, and 
and make the right balance because you don't confront uh, for everything. Some things you just ignore, let it pass. It's just like you forgive it and you, you go on. But certain things you need to confront so that there will be no hatred that will be nursed into your heart. This is a very, very dangerous. Why do uh, divorce happen? On the day of the wedding, I love you, <laughs> I will cherish you, I will love you for the rest of my life. Is that right? Yes. Good times and bad times. Wow, that's powerful. Bad times happen. You're hurting me big times. You're nagging, you're aggressive, you're angry. And you, uh, you know, it's not fair, I do all the work, you do nothing, you're lazy, or whatever it is. You spend all the money, the, you put our family in danger on credit, and that's enough, I have to get the family out of this crisis, and always. And then we nurse, nurse hatred, nurse hatred, and one day, I want a divorce. <laughs> that's, that's how it happened. In a church, it can be uh, leaving the church. Actually, it happens all the time. People are leaving the church not because God is not good to them. It's because somebody in the church has done something. And that person, unfortunately, has not probably have not also been strong enough or, or didn't know that or didn't know how to go to that person and say, L listen, Y y your behavior has hurt me, or your words, what you have done, I I'm really hurt, you know, or something like that. So we don't know how to practice that, but it is very, very re real. And it says that you will not be held guilty for their sins. So if the person is, you're in a group of person, and that person is doing something wrong, and you associate, that person spread a rumor, and you associate, you are participating to, the, to that sin also. So you, have to, you don't want to be held guilty. So that expression here, not to, to be held guilty, it's uh, have to do with speak what's right. It's not right, speak it. It's right, speak it. You, we do it and Paul is exhorting us to do it in love. Speak the truth and love, which is another thing that is very difficult to balance and to pick. Because many times when you confront, I'm already it too angry and I don't confront and love in the right way. I shout at you, I'm angry, I cry, I shout, and all this. So that's not the right way to, to, to confront. So when time to confront happens, there's need to be a, some kind of a prayerful approach to confrontation so that there is peace, that, that the motives are pure, you want restoration, you want harmony, you want to uh, re uh, mirror the character of God, you want to, to keep the unity uh, um, among everybody, so y you are confronting, you are ready to confront. If you are not ready to confront, it will be like a war in the house. You understand? Uh, 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 have you seen a husband and a wife fighting? That's what happened when we're not ready to confront. It's the same thing. 18, do not seek revenge or bear a grudge against a fellow Israelite or against your neighbor, again another, but love your neighbor as yourself. So you see that there is nothing so spiritual in this list here. But I'm also very encouraged because this is holiness. This is what God asks his people to stand by to be in holiness, to be accepted in His holiness. Is, is that attainable? Yes. Is, is that basic? Yes. Is, is that practical? It, does that touch our daily life? Yes. It's all about daily life. You don't have to be a superstar. You don't have to be a missionary. You don't have to be a priest, a pastor. You can be a mother. You can be an architect. You can be anything here and be holy. This is, this is everybody is called to be holy and, and, this, and this list here. Are you holy? <laughs> yes, okay. God says you must be holy. Okay, if you, all right. Look at the list. If you look at the list, if you continue a little bit, I think we stop here. Okay, 33. Do not, do not mistreat foreigners. 
Treat them like natives. Love them as you love yourself. When I read this yesterday, I really got something. Because I am not practicing that. I am not practicing that. With the refugee crisis in the world, many of people are coming to my country, changing everything. I'm very upset about it. But then God says, treat them like natives, love them as you love yourself. Says, Whoa, wow, this is not what I have been doing. Okay, but it speaks to my heart. Do not mistreat foreigners. Yesterday there was um, Friday, Brother Philip, uh, African brother, uh, told us that one of his Congolese brothers uh, was in hospital. Uh, he had been for months uh, in uh, dialysis. He needed a kidney and he passed away. You know why he passed away? Because in Hong Kong, since he is an asylum seeker, he was, he was not put on the list to receive a kidney. He could have been safe, but he was not safe voluntarily. Okay, gave them some treatment and everything. So he's quite young, he's been a leader of the uh, French speaking community at the Vine Church. I know him personally and he passed away because he's an asylum seeker. So when I look at this, uh, when I heard this news and I look at this text, I'm saying, whoa, there's something wrong. Treat them like the native. Treat them like you would treat the fellow Israelites. That's what it says. So it, it costs something. You know, in the, when you look at the world history, there, are, there have been many, many crises, like social crises, invasions of lands, wars, borders have been made, countries have been destroyed and taken over. You know, you, you see the great in, invaders, uh, Alexander the Greek, you know, like uh, or the, the, when the, the Mongol invaded part of Europe or anything. So it's part of his story. We forget about it because we live it today. You know that in Hong Kong, Hong Kong, a short history has experienced three big major uh, crisis of being in, in, invaded by Chinese mainland people here. Big crisis in China. So people were r running through to be safe when the, the British were here. So Hong Kong has become part of that. So there was a big, big um, in, invasions, you know, at the time of the war with the, 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 the Japanese. But before that, there was a big famine, and then the Japanese came. And there's, there, are, there were movements, and during the cultural revolutions, there are movements where people, if they want to live, they need to go somewhere else. So today, these people are Hong Kong people. They pay taxes, they work, and they live under the land. But if they would not have been accepted, uh, at the time when they would come, their life would have been misery. So it, it tells me that when, when the, the, the crisis happened, like in Germany, what are they going, how are they going to survive with such a number of uh, refugees to come? But now they, they need to treat them like that. This is God saying that. This is not a government. It's not about being not disturbed or not. It's going to be disturbing. It's going to be disturbing. Europe is never going to be the same. Hong Kong is never going to be the same. After 9-11, the world has never been to be the same. It's a dangerous world everywhere. But God says, if they come to your country, this is how you are to live. So maybe people don't like them. People will make votes against them. But the Christian community should be able to treat them just like God says to treat them. Do you understand what I'm saying? It's to reflect God's uh, ho holiness. Use honest scales. When you do business, just be honest. Just tell the truth. Use honest scales and weights and, and, and everything. So that list is all starting with do not. Is it not? It's a negative list. So it's funny because many times we say, oh, we don't like commandments. Do not, do not. But this is a positive way of life expressed with negative words. Do not do something bad, in other words. Do not harm someone. Do not conduct yourself like a jerk. Just, just like, a, do, do not do something bad. Be like God is. And it, it, it makes me think of 1 Corinthians chapter 13, which has a lot of negative and sinful I'll read you some of it. Love is not jealous. 
Love is not boastful. Love is not proud. Love is not rude. Love does not demand its own way. Love is not irritable. Love doesn't keep no records of being wrong. Love does not rejoice about injustice. That's a very similar, isn't it? You could make that list, make the other list just next to it, and you will find that Old Testament, New Testament are saying about the same thing. And, and this, is, this is what we learn. Leviticus is the foundation. It's so important for us. It's such a foundation for us. You are an ordinary person living in a family, going to work. You have colleagues. You attend a church family. And, and what you say and what you do, you reflect or you don't reflect the character of God by your actions. This is, this is what it is. The remedy against nursing hatred is confronting people or loving people. You know, about confronting people, look at the one uh, little scriptures here that I will read. Second Samuel 13, 22. Absalom. Absalom hate his brother, okay? The brother who had raped his sister. Remember the Bible? You know the Bible is so wonderful because you find illustration about everything in, in the Bible. Absalom never said a word to Ammon, either good or bad, okay? He hated Ammon, but he never said it. He never said he pretended because he, he had a plan, he had a grudge. He nursed, he nursed hatred that led to the murder. To, to murdering his own brother because he had disgraced his sister. When matters should be dealt with openly and frankly so that this N-word hatred will not sink in and lead to uh, other sin. Then look at, click the next one, and then you will see what God is saying. Right in the midst of that list here, God says, don't, 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 but love your neighbor as yourself, I am the Lord. And if you look at verse 34 here, love them as you love yourself. Twice in the same chapter. And do you know that this verse here is quoted so much by the Lord Jesus, the Apostle Paul, uh, First John, many times by the Apostle Paul, Jesus talks a lot. It is, it is a main quotation in the New Testament. It comes right from there. Amen? This is so important. Galatians 5, 4, the next slide. Galatians 5, 14, for the whole law can be summed up in one command, love your neighbor as yourself. If you click, you will see Jesus quoting it. Jesus said to him, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind. This is Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 5. And this is the first and great commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself, Leviticus 19.18. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. The greatest and the second one is as, as important as the other one. Amen? This is what God is telling us this morning. And in this text, Jesus says, love yourself. Uh, well, okay, love yourself. Let's talk about love yourself. Love yourself. Because this is a message that we hear in our generation today. I was uh, reading about uh, Whitney Houston having the, a song uh, that became very popular. The greatest love of all is to learn to love yourself. Okay, maybe there is a context in the song. If you know what uh, inspired her, maybe she was depressed. Uh, maybe uh, she was a victim of something and then she had to learn to accept herself. This, okay. But this is not what God is telling us. Have you, have you, okay, listen, have you ever needed a class to love yourself, to tell you how to love yourself? Did you need to go to school? Did you have to read a book about loving yourself? No. This is, this is what we do. We love ourselves. We idolize ourselves. We pamper ourselves. We protect ourselves. We are so caring about, our, about ourselves. So that's, that's what we do. So here Jesus gives us another um, commentary. Matthew 7, 12, verse, uh, slide 6. Do to others whatever you would like them to do to you, 
This is the essence of all that is taught in the Law and the Prophets. This is wonderful a way to interpret how to put it in practice. Do it at home with your spouse. Do it at home with your, with your children. Do it when you go to work. Do it with your church mate. Do to others whatever you would like them to do. Because when, when we do that, the reason is very simple and then we will conclude. Loving God is invisible. You love God? I love God. How do I know you love God? How do you know I love God? It's invisible. Whether you have a passion for God, I have a passion for God, I can see it, I can raise my hands, I can sing the songs, but how do you know that I love God? Love is invisible. When I love my neighbor according to God, I mirror his character. I show that I really love him, uh, that I have received his love, that I appreciate his love, that his word is important to me, so that I go and live out what he's telling me to do. That's the message of Leviticus. It is an internal, an internal passion in my heart, but it becomes a visible expression when you love somebody else. First John says, and anyway, uh, I will not read it all, our actions will show that we belong to the truth. If you love not only with words, but in actions and truth. James calls it the royal law. There is one law that is above all other law, the royal law. Love your neighbor as yourself. If you obey the law, you are doing right. And there's always a context in which these verses are given to you. Like, for instance, in James, uh, in First John, there's about uh, giving money or helping the, the needy when, when you need it. So that's a practical down-to-earth love manifestation. And James, it is based, if you look at the chapter, it's the poor and the rich come to church. You take, oh, the rich, well, come, come and sit here. You poor, go and sit in the back. Okay, so that, that's the context of that, of that one. And then R Paul quoted in uh, Romans 13. And if you look at Romans 13, this is uh, next. Put it all and we will finish quickly with that. Romans 13 is again very similar in context to Leviticus 19. Uh, the, the context of that is um, earlier in the chapter, Paul brings up a few social duties. Submit to authorities, pay your taxes, and that's why he says, owe nothing to anyone except your obligation to love one another. If you love your neighbor, you will fulfill the requirements of God's law. Then he goes on to many uh, negative uh, uh, law, some uh, commandments forbidding acts that would harm your neighbor. Adultery, murder, steal, bearing false witnesses, uh, lusting. So he's bringing these, the same thing as in, in Leviticus, because these are, would be harming someone else. You, you have an affair with your neighbor's wife, you're going to do something, you steal from somebody, you bear false witness, you will go to do hurting someone. In verse 10, love never does anything that is harmful to his neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfillment of the law. So go to the next slide, and we will read it uh, next. Next slide. Now for us, New Testament Christian, Jesus is the door into the divine presence of God, into the divine love that fills our heart. And, and because it fills our heart, it, it embraces everyone. It embraces ourselves, it embraces our church mate, it embraces anybody, and those that we call aliens or foreigners, they are included in that. It says a quotation from Fred Gazer. When you love your neighbor as yourself, you mirror the character of God and you are partakers of his divine nature. That's a wonderful message, a gem found in the book of Leviticus that is expressed strongly, repeatedly in the New Testament in many, many contexts. Bless them. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Father.